Thank you. So good morning, everyone. We changed totally the topic. Um, so I'm fluvial geomorphologist, and I use models um, and very shortly develop one. So um, I will start just by defining what in-stream large wood is uh, and why it is important. So why do we care about this? Uh, and then I will focus on the first numerical model that was developed to simulate the transport of wood in rivers called Iverwood. Um, I will show you how we validated this model using uh, data from flume experiments and field observations. Um, and then I will show you also two main applications. So how we use the model to explore wood dynamics in rivers and uh, better understand uh, rivers in general. Uh, and also I will focus, as Irina said, uh, on the related hazards or potential hazards related to wood transport. So in-stream large wood refers to down trees, uh, trunks, root buds, and branches that fall in a river. And so they are the base of the river's organic matter supply. And in some rivers, together with the living trees, uh, they are a major reservoir of organic carbon. But when a tree falls in a river, uh, it triggers a lot of processes. So uh, it creates an obstruction that is um, a source of flow resistance and energy dissipation, which is affecting the hydraulics. So it's usually lowering the flow velocity, uh, increasing the water depth and affecting turbulence. And so this has an effect on the sediment dynamics and is uh, influencing the sediment storage and sorting. And it's also affecting uh, morphodynamics. So it may enhance channel mobility, shifting, avulsions, channel widening, river bank erosion. Um, so wood adds physical complexity to rivers and so improves habitat diversity. And this is not happening just at the very local scale. It's actually uh, influencing river processes, forms, and functions across scales. And so, it may um, affect uh, channel and flat plane connectivity and eventually in the long term is uh, influencing fluxes at the catchment scale. And so wood is also affecting uh, the water chemistry and temperature. It provides a hard substrate for the biofilm to colonize. Uh, it provides food, shelter and nursery areas for aquatic species. Um, it's also influencing the establishment of vegetation and the vegetation successions and the development of islands in rivers. And it's also uh, the combination of the, or the interactions between the flow, the sediment and the water provides uh, better conditions for many species and not only aquatic species. So wood is uh, influencing the entire food web. And so this is why wood is a key element sustaining uh, river, river's health uh, and also uh, providing resilience to river ecosystems. And this is the reason why after centuries mm, removing wood from rivers, we are actually seeing an increase in the rain production of wood to rivers worldwide. Uh, so wood is uh, increasingly used for river restoration. But Although most of the time wood is stable in river channels as sediment, uh, during floods, large quantities of wood might be transported. And so this is an example from a river in Utah. Um, and so where this wood uh, goes, uh, it might encounter obstacles like critical sections like bridges or dams, and so may cause some hazards. But what is really important to highlight here is that none of the hazards posed by wood are inherent to the wood itself. So the wood is not the problem. The problem are the infrastructures that we design to not allow the wood to pass. And so we are artificially enhancing the trapping efficiency of rivers and the transport capacity. And I will go back to this uh, later. Uh, so there is a vital need to understand wood dynamics and integrate this understanding uh, in, in uh, the way we manage rivers. And so um, this is why we recently defined the wood regime uh, in a similar way than was done for the flow and the sediment regimes. But compared to the flow and sediment regimes that have been studied for 
decades, even centuries. Um, the science or the research in Boonin rivers is relatively young. And we face a very important limiting factor is the lack of data. So there are no gouging stations monitoring wood transport. Um, so this is also why the, we still face uh, major scientific questions that might sound quite basic, but we still don't fully understand how wood moves in rivers, uh, how much wood we can expect to have during a flood, when might be transported, uh, where it goes and where is deposited, and what are the potential impacts and hazards. So numerical modeling is a powerful tool to explore uh, these questions. And so before talking about Iver wood, let me introduce you Iver. So Iver is a 2D hydraulic model that was developed uh, so to simulate the free surface flow in rivers and estuaries. Uh, it was developed mostly by, the, by scientists at the University of Catalonia and La Coruña in Spain. Uh, it's distributed for free. You can download it on this website. It is both in English and Spanish. Um, and the first version was released in 2010. So here I listed some of the main uh, characteristics of the model. So hydrodynamics are solving the sand banana equations in two dimensions using an explicit finite volume scheme on unstructured meshes. Uh, it solves subcritical and supercritical flow. Um, it's conservative. It includes several models for turbulence. Uh, it solves morphodynamics and sediment transport. And it is uh, integrated in a user-friendly pre- and post-processing interface. So as with any other hydraulic model, Iver has been applied for uh, studying hydromorphodynamics and assessing uh, flood hazard and risks, but also for eco-hydraulics and fish habitat and water quality. And it has many modules that allow the model to solve uh, or to, to study other processes like uh, dam breaching, hydrological processes, uh, pollutant distribution, or it also allows the simulation of non-Newtonian flows like no avalanches or debris flows. So a few years ago, already 10 years ago, uh, we coupled a module to simulate the transport of, of wood. And we did this by coupling a Lagrangian scheme, so a discrete element approach to the Eulerian uh, model. So I will not go into all the details, but so we simulate individual pieces of wood and the incipient motion of these pieces of wood, assuming them as cylinders with or without roots uh, is based on a force balance. And so the, we have the driving forces, the, the, uh, the drag forces and the gravitational forces, and then the friction, the resisting forces. And these are the main parameters that are uh, considered in this equation, in this force balance. So we have the wood density, the size of the wood, the water depth, the flow velocity, and some coefficients, the friction and the drag coefficients. And with them, we um, have two different types of transport mechanisms. So wood may slide or drag on the riverbed or may float. And so um, the model also includes interactions between the wood and the geometry, so the, uh, the morphology of the river interactions between uh, the wood themselves by assuming elastic or unelastic collisions, um, and then interactions between the wood and internal conditions like bridges. I said that the module is fully coupled. So this means that the presence of wood has an influence on the hydrodynamics and the hydrodynamics are controlling the motion of the wood pieces. And we did this by adding um, a drag to the San Benant equation. So since we started developing this model, as I said, more than 10 years ago, we used um, observations to validate uh, the model. So the first validation we did was in a very simple setup in a flume in a very straight, uh, small channel with some obstacles and constraints to get some recirculation zones. And we focused on the trajectories of uh, floating uh, cylinders, and then we compare their trajectories, rotation, velocities, 
And so here I show you one example of this comparison. And as you see, the model was uh, capturing the behavior observed in the flu. Uh, recently, we uh, added more complexity to the uh, model. So uh, we validated the behavior of not only the floating logs, but also these uh, dragging logs. And so we used a braided uh, flume with a complex morphology, which is characterized also by uh, shallow waters. So in these systems, the wood is not only floating, it's also dragging on top of the bars and on the channels. Um, so here we focus on validating travel distances, uh, the accumulation of wood in jams, and the effect of roots. So this is an example of one of these uh, runs that we uh, did to reproduce the flume experiments. And here I show you in this uh, box plots, so we compare the flume observations with the numerical model, focus on the travel distance for different scenarios using different sizes of wood. And so you see that uh, we, or the model, uh, again, reproduced uh, the patterns observed in the flume of course, with some differences. And the main difference here was that the variability observed in the numerical model was much smaller than in the flume. Still, we have some ways to add kind of stochasticity to the numerical model, but I will not go into details. Uh, so I said that we lack observation, so we are trying also to fill this gap and we are um, um, uh, doing uh, field surveys so we are using metal and plastic tags to track wood in rivers, but we are also using radio frequency transmitters. We use drones and cameras, and we also use citizen science. So we use uh, videos of people just recording flats with a lot of wood. And so we extract quantitative information from these videos. And we are currently developing machine learning algorithms. So we are using deep learning uh, to automatically detect uh, wood detect and track wood on the drone imagery and the uh, videos from video cameras. So we use this information to get uh, the positional patterns and wood fluxes that we can use to uh, validate the model. So two main applications now. Uh, one application to better understand uh, wood uh, dynamics. So we use the model in a multi-scenario, multi-run approach. And so we compare wood transport in contrasting river morphologies. So we compare two river reaches, one single thread channelized and another one uh, multi-thread braided uh, river reach. And so the first thing we can observe in this graph is uh, based on the transport ratio. So meaning one means uh, Full transport, so all pieces entering the ring, the reeds are uh, going out. So we observe a significantly higher uh, transport capacity or transport ratio in these channelized uh, river reaches versus the braided morphologies. But we also observe that the capacity to transport larger pieces was larger in this uh, straight channel. So here we again have the re results from different scenarios. Uh, and so we observe that uh, in these straight channels, the flow is able to move very large pieces of wood, while in these braided systems, uh, only small pieces are mobilized. And so um, by channelizing rivers, what we are doing is artificially increasing the transport capacity and competence of the flow to move the wood and potentially enhancing hazards uh, downstream. Um, we also uh, analyzed the, um, the position of wood. So by again running multiple scenarios, we computed a depositional probability. And so we observe um, that um, this uh, probability to, so this depositional probability changes with this chart. And during high flows, the natural uh, place for the wood to be deposited is the flat plane. And so again, by modifying the connectivity between the channel and the flat plane, we are uh, decreasing the deposition of wood and then increasing the transport uh, downstream. 
In this other example, we analyzed, we, we simulated the confluence of two rivers, one of them uh, supplied with wood, and we explore interactions between the flow, the wood, and sediment. And so in this graph, you have uh, water elevation and critical diameter, meaning the size of the sediment that the flow is able to move. And so if uh, we, we compare two scenarios with and without wood, and so if we focus on the uh, water elevation, so the gray lines, we observe that the presence of wood increased the water depth downstream from the confluence and lower the velocity. And now if we look at the critical diameter, we observed also a decrease in the sediment size that the flow uh, is uh, carrying. So wood influences the flow uh, transport capacity. Uh, regarding the potential hazards, um, one of the first uh, um, works we did was to use the model to identify critical sections. So in this uh, river crossing a town where several bridges are located, we, uh, the model allowed us to identify the one that was um, more prone to trap uh, wood. And we, for the first time, uh, used this to um, uh, include wood transport in a, risk, in a flood risk assessment. So we quantified the potential losses and we compared the scenarios with and without wood, and we observed that the blockage of bridges uh, caused up to 50% more economical losses uh, for the same discharge. Um, so the bridge clogging or the blockage probability depend, depends on many factors. Um, so the model allowed us to uh, explore these different factors, and one important uh, factor is the discharge. So Again, running multiple scenarios for this river in Poland, uh, we computed this blockage probability and we observed that in general, uh, the blockage probability increases with this chart, but until a certain threshold. So uh, this means that for very extreme floods, uh, the blockage or the presence of wood might not be so relevant. The flood is, flood is huge anyway, uh, but for intermediate uh, floods, the transport of wood may uh, significantly increased uh, the flooding. Um, the, not only the discharge, also, of course, the amount of wood and the size of the wood is important. And again, here we found uh, a threshold which is related to the size of the wood re relative to the size of the channel or the bridge. And there are other processes that might be uh, happening when a bridge is blocked, not only this backwater effect or this. Uh, flooding, uh, but processes like uh, erosion, so a scour or widening. So we explored this in this uh, river in Chile that is heavily affected by volcanic eruptions. So there is a huge supply of sediment and wood. And so um, we again use the model to explore this uh, flow uh, wood sediment interactions. And we observed that by blocking the bridge with wood, uh, we enhance uh, the scour, so the erosion we see in this graph here. Um, and the model also allowed to uh, see that among the different piers, the bridge piers uh, present within the channel, one of them was actually more prone to trap the wood. And this was observed during a past flood in 2015. So just to finish, um, I would like to stress that, of course, the model is just a simplification and we are trying to use a deterministic model to reproduce a quasi-stochastic process. Uh, and so still there are many limitations and uncertainties, uh, but um, we can use the model to test hypotheses, run multiple scenarios, and um, we can use it to understand processes that are very difficult to observe in rivers. And with this, I finish and I thank you for your attention. That was an excellent overview for um, fluvial, of fluvial geomorphologists. And I think it's um, linked well to Kyle's talk of yesterday. Um, we'll allow for one question before we move on to the next talk, if there is one. Uh, 
Thank you for um, the great presentation. So I have the two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, related to the model. So your model use different types of meshes. I mean, like a, a mesh for the fluid, other one for the sediment, either for the wood. And the other one is uh, what uh, type or technique you use for analyze the fluid in the experiments? So the model uses two different meshes, one for the uh, hydraulics and the morphodynamics, and one for the wood. Because it's a Lagrangian mesh. So yeah, we had to couple the two meshes. And the other question is the, the technique. It's about the technique for analyze the, flu the, the flow in the, in the experiments, uh, so kind so of uh, PIB or something. Uh, we use uh, measurements of so like flow velocity measurements, uh, ABCP. And uh, for example, in the first experiments I show, uh, this we did ourselves in the lab. The, the other ones in the brightest uh, flume, they were done before and then we use the data afterwards. So I cannot tell you all the details, but some of the experiments were recorded and we used also the video frames and the recording of the experiment. Thank you so much. 